Recently on Higher Journeys, we profiled the story of Kelly, a single woman in her mid-40s who has been plagued by regular nightly visits from a strange figure at the foot of her bed. This being says nothing and does nothing except gaze over Kelly as she sleeps. Although initially startled and at times frightened, Kelly has grown used to her mysterious visitor, but has no explanation for who or what this being represents. As tempting as it may be to write off this extraordinary tale as mere delusion, we learn from paranormal researcher Rosemary Ellen Guiley that this phenomenon she calls shadow people is far more common than we might realize, and according to her research, the shadow people phenomenon has occurred throughout human history. First of all, I'm so happy to have you back. I know that we spoke, um, gosh, it's probably been a few months now when we were discussing your wonderful book, Talking to the Dead. I still highly recommend that to everybody. It's phenomenal. But today we're going to be talking about something um, quite fascinating to me, um, and that is the shadow person phenomenon. I know that you've been um, you know, researching this phenomenon for quite some time, and, and although it still can be a bit nebulous in terms of the features. I really want to get your way in on a particular account that I uh, covered, uh, a woman by the name of Kelly, who believes to have had, uh, uh, not believes, uh, something that she would call a shadow person um, uh, phenomena. So I want to I wanted ask you a couple of questions about, um, first maybe give us a little bit of a background on how you would describe shadow people, for lack of a better word. Shadow people are usually bedroom visitors. They have the appearance of being a dark, human-like silhouette, very solid black. You can't see through it. There usually are no features on it, no details of face or clothing. It's uh, typically a male outline, very tall, six to seven feet tall. And often they look like they're wearing a coat or a hat. Sometimes they look hooded. Um, sometimes they look like uh, the being that Kelly describes as a, a silhouette that's very muscular and uh, like, you know, like the Spider-Man silhouette mm. uh, that we're familiar with from the comics and the movies. Uh, there are uh, core experiences where uh, most uh, accounts fall into certain characteristics and patterns, and then there are what I call subcategories or satellite experiences that uh, are all part of the shadow person phenomenon. These visitations, I believe, have been going on for centuries, perhaps even as long as human beings have been on the planet, and we've called them by different things. I think in the Middle Ages, the accounts uh, that survive of phantom nuns and monks probably were shadow people. At any rate, these bedroom visitors uh, usually are seen standing by the bed or at the foot of the bed. Sometimes they're seen emerging from a closet or out from under the bed or coming in the doorway. And most of the time they observe, or they seem to be observing. We don't know because we can't see any eyes on them. But they give the demeanor of staring at the person in bed. Uh, some of them will act out very aggressively toward uh, the human and attack by grabbing, choking, um, bringing a, a great pressure and weight down on the chest, even engaging in physical tussles with someone. Mm -hmm. But uh, oftentimes they just observe, and sometimes they will vanish uh, when they realize that they've been noticed, and other times they don't. Many people believe them to be malevolent because they seem to throw off a, an intense negative energy. Mm -hmm. And others say, well, they're they're put off by them, maybe even a little frightened by them, but um, they don't feel threatened uh, or in the presence of something, as they would call it, evil. Mm -hmm. I've been studying this phenomenon in uh, quite some depth since about 2004, and I have interviewed uh, hundreds of people. I have collected hundreds and hundreds of accounts. I have over 600 in my database now, and that's just what I've collected. If you go on the Internet, you will find even more wow. because um, people have, uh, with the attention focused on this topic, people have begun to report their experiences. So Kelly's experience was of great interest to me because she, she falls in that shadow person experiencer category. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that uh, there, there are agendas being pursued here. 
That's interesting. Okay. You know, right up front, I want to I want to just say this for the record. You have been very articulate over the years in saying that you've never been out to prove the paranormal because it's just such a slippery uh, land, too slippery and too blurry of a landscape. But um, so, so the purpose of this conversation is not necessarily to prove or disprove the validity of, of, of Kelly's phenomenon, but we do want to discuss some of the features of, of her particular scenario, um, you know, that she's been involved with for quite some time. Now, you know, it's interesting, you said something, Rosemary, you said that oftentimes the, the experiencers that are having this phenomenon believe the entity to be malevolent, um, threatening in some way, menacing in some way. Kelly was clear in saying that, you know, she never felt that this presence, although of course when she sees it she's startled, but she never gets the feeling that it's a malevolent presence. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Let me just also say that she, when I kind of probed a little bit, she said to me that she thought perhaps it might be some sort of a guardian, even though it was, you know, the way this image tends to show up, it's not necessarily a comforting thing. Do you get that from any of your uh, any of the cases that you've heard, and can you elaborate maybe a little bit? Yes, and it definitely falls right into the pattern that has emerged in in my research. I, I would like to say one thing about proving the paranormal, however. Mm -hmm. um, I have always made it clear in my work that I do not attempt to prove the paranormal because for me it exists. And I'm much more interested in the how and the why rather than trying to demonstrate to a cynic that right. people have these experiences. Right. Uh, the people who come to me are people who are experiencers and they're looking for explanations and meanings. And um, all, all one has to do is examine the literature uh, throughout the course of human history to see that human beings have had encounters with the unknown from the beginning of uh, anecdotal history, mm -hmm. and uh, that's part of our folklore, our mythology, our uh, paranormal literature, our religious literature, and so I'm interested in what are our interactions with beings in other dimensions, mm -hmm. and uh, can we uh, categorize them in any way sure. uh, to better understand them. Right. So shadow people are a major experience, and I believe, when I started researching this, I had no idea how huge it is, but I believe that uh, even with all the reports that have been logged in uh, in the past few years, that we're still only seeing the tip of the iceberg. Now, um, most people feel that shadow people are malevolent and that these beings radiate a lot of hostility. So let's deal with that first. Mm -hmm. I think that there is a reason for that. Beings who come into our dimension need energy in order to sustain their presence. And that energy usually comes from living things, from people, from animals, even from the, the world of nature. And by throwing off um, an antagonistic or malevolent energy, that um, elicits an instinctive, adrenaline rush from human beings. It's a fear reaction. Absolutely. That's packed with energy. Mm -hmm. So in a way, I think, uh, you know, so they vampirize us, literally, uh, by, um, you know, kind of flexing their muscle, more or less. Whether or not they intend to bring any harm to us, it's a way of getting uh, what they need in order to sustain, sustain themselves because they, they don't have the same... Uh, form that we do, right? Uh, and um, I do think that they are shapeshifters. That is fascinating. You know, you're, what you're bringing up, Rosemary, about the sort of parasiting or vampiring of ener human energy is uh, also a ubiquitous phenomenon. It se seems when we're talking about you know entities that seem to be just outside of our physical space, that including ghosts. Um, you know, some ET beings, you know, I won't name names, uh, but it, it just seems that this is a common feature. It really kind of gets us into um, dimensions, and, you know, we often hear the term astral dimension or even lower astral dimension as one that is so incredibly close to us and yet not fully physical, and that a lot of these beings may in fact emanate from that lower astral realm, sort of a dense and yet not fully physical uh, realm. W what are your thoughts on that? 
in terms of the realm that they may be coming from? Uh, well, the, uh, the physics model that we have a multidimensional reality right here on Earth makes complete sense to me. And I've always believed that from the beginning of my research, that uh, it seemed um, most logical to me that the beings that we're encountering are coming from other dimensions. That is, they live in a reality in their own right, like we live in our reality. And um, there's usually no intersection between the two. Uh, but every now and then they bump into each other, or beings uh, seem to be able to have uh, learn navigation between dimensions. Mm -hmm. I think that um, we more or less have accidental falls, falls through the window, uh, but some other beings have learned how to uh, deliberately come and go. And um, wow. many of them seem to be able to come and go at will. And I think uh, that's what we're dealing with, with shadow people, visitors. Mm -hmm. Now, the, uh, the way this phenomenon has developed by examining hundreds and hundreds of cases and the experiencers themselves, um, they are pretty much divided between males and females. That was a question I had, actually. Yeah. It's, uh, wow. You know, okay. It's not a distraught female thing, like some people would like to think. Mm -hmm. um, men have these experiences, too. People of all ages have them. It's not a kitty boogeyman under the closet, in the closet sort of thing. Adults can have them. Some people have one experience in their entire life, and it leaves uh, a pretty strong memory. Um, most people don't want to encounter these beings again. Other people are serial experiencers. Mm -hmm. They have them for a period of time in their lives, and then the experiences go away. Some are place-oriented. People move to a house. Mm -hmm. They have the experiences. They move away. The experiences stop. Some are multi-generational, that is, the, the same entity is seen by multiple members in the family, and this being seems to follow the family lineage. Mm -hmm. So um, we have these subsets of, uh, of experiences. Now, to explain why um, Kelly feels that this being may even be a guardian, that makes complete sense to me, mm -hmm. even though I would say 99.9% .9 of all experiences on the other end where people feel frightened and fearful of these beings. I came to the conclusion some time ago that shadow people are a form of jinn. And the jinn are not very well known in Western culture, but they've been part of the supernatural lore of this planet since ancient times. They uh, are uh, a race of entities, like we are a race of entities, and they once uh, they once lived where we live, and for various uh, reasons, they got pushed out to another realm. They live in another dimension attached to the Earth, mm -hmm. and some of them have uh, an intense curiosity about human beings. Some of them develop romantic attachments to humans, and some of them want to torment people, hmm. even be supernatural terrorists, because they feel we supplanted what should be rightfully theirs. And in ancient tradition, um, these beings were uh, believed to be born with uh, attached to human beings, much like we have the concept of guardian angels. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the ancient tradition, these spirits or these beings uh, the Greeks called them demonas, uh, and in the Middle Eastern culture, it was the jinn. That uh, one would be one or two would be born uh, along with you and would stay with you through life. And depending on its own temperament, might be good and urge you to do good things. Might be very protective, or could be very wicked and tricky, and and you know want to keep you upset. Uh, and I have quite a few accounts of people who feel that shadow people are, in some bizarre way, a guardian of theirs. Right. Well, that's what Kelly was saying. Absolutely. Well, that does fit the jinn profile. Mm -hmm. But um, oftentimes these beings do develop a sexual interest in humans when they're attached to people. Uh, and it may not start out that way, but it can develop that way. Hmm. Interesting. Just a quick question. I think you started to, to brush 
the subject a little bit in terms of just how pervasive this experience is. And in your data collection, would you could you surmise a percentage of the population that have had these experiences? I know that's probably difficult to do, but what is your sense of how common this is? Well, I'm not a statistician, and I haven't attempted to do a formal survey. Like I, I remember oh, about 20 years or so ago, the Roper organization polled a certain number of people and extrapolated out that, uh, you know, um, what was it, two, um, 20 million people had had, um, you know, ET experiences or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I depend heavily on voluntary reporting. Uh, so I, I can't say what percentage of the population, but I do believe it to be widespread. Mm-hmm. And every time I have discussed shadow people on a radio show um, or, you know, at a, at a conference, people come forward and they say, oh, my gosh, I mm-hmm. had an experience like that or, you know, it's one of the types of experiences, and I never knew that other people had them too. Right. So yeah. it's, a, um, it's a case, really, I think, of seeing the tip of the iceberg. Mm-hmm. And, I would agree. Um, people have these experiences, and, and they just kind of stuff them away as like, oh, well, you know, that was kind of weird, or yeah. and you know, I, um, yeah. must yeah. have been nightmares or, or something like that. Right. Right. Well, you know, that's in, indeed why I wanted to um, have this conversation and frankly tell Kelly's story because obviously I think there's a sense first of, you know, the logic mind, logical mind kicks in, you know, certainly when you hear a story like this on its face, it sounds like science fiction um, and, and probably to the experiencer themselves. And certainly there's that element of uh, potential ridicule. But I think that the, I think you, you've hit upon something that this probably is just the tip of the iceberg and that these experiences are probably far more widespread, uh, although not, you know, uh, dinnertime conversation, if you will. So that's a good point. You know, you, you made a quick reference to uh, alien abductions, and, and I, think it, um, I think in one of your uh, articles that you had written on shadow people, you asked the question as to, you know, in terms of trying to understand who and what they may be that it could be part of an alien monitoring program. Can you explain that a little bit more? There is a very strong connection to the ET abduction scenario, and I'm still pursuing this research. But um, this developed uh, after I had been studying shadow people for a couple of years. And uh, what I do is when I get an account, um, I uh, break it down into components because I'm looking for patterns. And I've interviewed as many people as I possibly can. Sometimes people don't want to be interviewed or they send you an email and they never, you know, that's all you have and they never answer any more questions. So um, some of my cases are fuller in detail than others. But I began to notice, uh, or rather I should say I noticed, a pattern emerging that people would volunteer that they also had ET abduction experiences. And uh, this would be part of the musing of, like, I don't know what's going on here, but I've had these experiences, too. So uh, this was a far higher um, proportion than Mm -hmm. I would have expected just by, you know, random chance. Mm -hmm. So I went back to my database and queried people. Um, You know, it's come to my attention that, there might be a link here, have you had experiences as well? And uh, this is a definite connection. Now, not every shadow person experiencer has had uh, ET experiences of any sort, let Mm -hmm. alone abduction experiences, but nonetheless, there is a connection. And uh, there are marked similarities in the way these beings approach people. Uh, They come at night when the person is sleeping. There's often a paralysis in bed. Mm -hmm. Uh, With the abductors, of course, the person feels taken away. Uh, There uh, is likely to be some sort of sexual uh, activity, and shadow people do engage in that as well. And some of the beings that 
people meet during their abduction experiences are very similar to shadow people, only they have more detail. Right. And uh, so I began to wonder then uh, if shadow people were a variation of ET, if they were artificial intelligence, drones, uh, were they working, were they separate uh, entities working with ETs? Were they separate entities spying on ETs? Mm. You know, uh, as perhaps two races, uh, different races of beings having conflicting interests in, in human beings. Interesting. Uh, well, and um, my conclusion uh, right now uh, is that uh, shadow people are a form of jinn. Jinn are masterful shapeshifters. They have an interest in human beings. Uh, they want to, they, their name means the hidden ones, and so it's very like them to come at night when they can be disguised. We don't know who they are, what they want, they don't communicate. And, uh, well, I'm, I'm not able to say that they are the abducting ETs. I believe them to be participating in that. Um, they could be borrowing ET forms, they could be uh, playing some sort of auxiliary role in it because um, of similar purposes and agendas. Mm -hmm. uh, in examining Jinn experiences and their characteristics and the literature that's been written about them for centuries, the picture that emerges is that they're great at masquerades. Um, if if they have an agenda with human beings and they think they can accomplish that by acting like a demon, they'll act like a demon. If they think they can accomplish that by acting like a fairy, they'll be like a fairy. Mm. Uh, and so this suits their whole modus operandi to participate in, um, in that encounter as well. Mm -hmm. Now one of the things that I did was I did go into the UFO community. I talked to people who uh, had conducted abduction research. Uh, not all of them were responsive. Most of them were dismissive of like, uh, oh yeah, you know, we know about these shadowy figures. It's just part of the ET thing. Well, it's not. Uh, it is. I mean, it is and it isn't. But um, when I uh, researched the literature that had been written on abductions, you know, there's a big outpouring of it uh, from about the, the 1980s on. Uh, and the earliest documented post-World War II abduction case we have, uh, at least in North America, is the Tahunga Canyon encounters in 1953. Mm -hmm. Now, I found in the literature over and over again that there were descriptions of shadow people. Uh, E.T. experiencers had had shadow people experiences in childhood. They had them throughout life. And the shadow people experiences often preceded an abduction. Not as, the shadow people would not be part of an abduction, but some sort of encounter with them often occurred before an abduction, sometimes after they had had an abduction experience. So there's this connection here, like Absolutely. what the heck is going on? Mm -hmm. And uh, if um, you know, if if we assume these beings to be jinn, who are um, interested and human beings, and I think they have a specific interest of some of them wanting to reclaim Earth territory, our dimension. Um, many of them seem to have sexual interest, and it is well documented in Jin lore that Jin and humans can create hybrids. Hybrids. This which, is yeah. uh, said in fairy literature as well. In fact, if you even look at the Bible, human beings have been you know, creating hybrid from the get-go in Genesis. You know, the Watchers, who I think were not angels but jinn, uh, uh, come down out of heaven and covet human women and, and um, you know, create the Nephilim. And so we've had this long-standing tradition of um, human entity hybrid. Well, if you were an entity and you had, you desired to have a bigger presence on Earth, you would need some sort of physical form that could get along uh, in this environment and be enough like us so that you would remain disguised. And hybrids are probably the best way to do that. Mm -hmm. That seems to be part of the ET abduction scenario is to create these hybrids. 
And uh, the gym could be very interested in doing the same thing. So uh, there are all, all kinds of speculative leads to follow in this, but a very interesting picture emerges uh, because a lot of these things are taking place literally under our own noses. They're hiding in plain sight. Hmm. That is absolutely fascinating. You know, I'm thinking as I'm listening to you talk about the types of people that might be having these experiences, I don't know if we really got into personality profiles Do you, in the data that you've collected, and I don't know whether you'd be able to glean this information from written accounts, people that are writing to you, but do you get a sense of a uh, the human, of course, per, the personality profile of the individual that may be having these experiences um, in terms of instability in any way, any childhood experiences that might have prompted such a thing, anything at all? I, I can um, put together some pieces to that puzzle. I have not had the benefit of having uh, psychological profiles done. Uh, for example, when the late John Mack mm -hmm. the ET uh, abduction victims, yes. uh, he had and, and, and interviewed them for his book, Abduction, which was a seminal work, uh, he had the benefit of um, having these people formally evaluated. Mm -hmm. And what I've been able to ascertain from my follow-up questions is that uh, the people who have the most extraordinary experiences and the ongoing experiences, the onset of the paranormal begins very, very early in life. Mm -hmm. It includes everything. Um, seeing ghosts, seeing fairies, mysterious lights in the sky, um, conversing with the dead, uh, not that any one person is going to have all of those things, but <laughs> these people seem to be open from the get-go. I see. So there may be something in their makeup that uh, makes them easier to access. Right. Or of more, and also of more interest to these beings. Mm -hmm. um, there's another subset uh, that, um, of people, usually adults, uh, who go through emotional turmoil. And I think that's because of the energy we throw off of depression, anxiety, fear, uh, even anger, um, that they would have a sudden onset of these shadow people visits uh, during these tumultuous times. Mm -hmm. um, you know, job change, divorce, a catastrophic illness, you know, things that just throw people for a loop. Right. Uh, and uh, that energy, again, may attract people. Now, everybody has trauma in life, and not all of us start having shadow people visits. So uh, my feeling is that the biggest wild card of all in uh, all of these equations is human consciousness. Sure. Mm -hmm. That uh, we, we have something in... Uh, the vibration of energy around us or the way uh, our thoughts go out into the ethers or something that, that we have not been able to um, understand that uh, attracts these beings. Mm -hmm. It might be like, um, you know, a lighthouse, you know, um, you know seeing a, a certain light out there in the ethers and uh, these entities get attracted. And I think many of them are just plain opportunists. Mm -hmm. You know, they see an opportunity, and uh, so they come around for a while, and then they get what they want, and they leave. Mm -hmm. And uh, others seem to be more attached to uh, individuals and families. Right. Well, in Kelly's case, you know, uh, it seems to be an individual situation, but it, it's, it's a situation that, again, has followed her, not necessarily... A, a, a scenario that's been in only in one place. It's followed her most of her life, but only her. As a matter of fact, I, you know, one of my questions for her is, you know, uh, when you have these experiences, has there ever been anyone else in the home? A couple of points I want to make on that. Um, and her answer to me was in the affirmative that yes. Um, uh, in fact, a couple of family members had not obviously not in her room, but in her apartment. Um, and in fact, one night she had a visitor and got up and screamed and then asked her brother who was visiting at the time the next morning if um, if uh, he could hear her and 
he said no. Um, but another point I wanted to make is she tells me now in the last, I don't know, three or four years, I, she's been in a pretty serious relationship and she says that whenever her boyfriend stays over, it doesn't happen. Hmm. It doesn't happen. Um, I have had similar accounts. Yeah. Um, and one that I can think of just off the top of my head because it was a recent interview uh, was uh, another lifelong experience for a man who is now in his 30s. And um, this, this shadow person, uh, he believes, broke up his marriage. And this also uh, conforms to the characteristics of what would be called the Jinn companion, mm -hmm. Kareem, uh, the entity that's born with you and is a lifelong companion. As I mentioned, some of them develop these romantic attachments to humans. And then they get very jealous of romantic relationships that that the humans have, and so they um, they can upset relationships. They can interfere in your health, your luck, your moods, emotions, dreams. Um, some of them have the ability to um, insert themselves in in very dramatic ways. But at any rate, after after his divorce, then he began having very marked nighttime visits of this entity, and they got to be of increasing sexual nature. But then when he started another serious relationship and that woman moved in with him, the visit stopped. Hmm. Uh, and he doesn't know why. Uh, there may be something in her energy field that uh, kind of disrupts the ability of, of this entity to move in, more or less. Uh, or, I mean, who knows? We can only also speculate that maybe the entity says, well, okay, I like her, so... As long as I'm not totally out of the picture, that's fine with me. Well, that brings up the question of shared experiences. I think you've addressed that on a couple of occasions that where, you know, in some cases, um, in a case like this, uh, it's the individual and individual that's having the experience and it's not necessarily shared or, in fact, the shadow person can disappear with the presence of someone else. But are, have there been um, cases of people that have seen, groups of people even, that have seen these entities, husbands and wives in, in bed, waking up at the same time and seeing an image? Yes, I have cases of uh, husbands, wives, uh, you know, romantic partners, significant others, siblings, um, parents, grandparents, you know, people who share a household, friends, you know, like staying over for the night sort of thing. Uh, they fall into all of those categories. Wow. Fascinating. Well, I want to talk a little bit about the dreamscape. This was something that really um, made me curious as I was interviewing Kelly. Um, she seems to think that these phenomena happen most often after she has come, come out of a vivid dream. In other words, there seems to be some link, I'm surmising, between the dream, not necessarily the scene, but a vivid dream, a very, very active dream, and then she will, something will awaken her and then see this presence. So my question to her was, gee, you know, we've all, we've all um, uh, become familiar with the idea that the dreamscape could very well be another dimension of reality and that we're very active uh, th there as we are here. But the question becomes, is there perhaps a bridge that's created when people like Kelly and Kelly are having dreams and then subsequently having the visitors? Could these entities be following her, or this entity be following her from the dreamscape and perhaps using her as a bridge to come here? It's entirely plausible, and it would certainly fit uh, the characteristics that I have observed in collecting so many different accounts. Um, one of the things that many entities um, use to get a line on people and also like a fishing line into this dimension is they use our emotions, they can use our thoughts, mm -hmm. and they seem to have the ability also to use dreaming consciousness. So it could very well be that she might be a certain kind of dreamer. Um, you know, some people have more lucid dreams than others. Uh, some people 
have vivid color dreams. Some people dream in black and white. And there may be something in her dreaming consciousness that opens a portal or a doorway uh, that this particular entity um, is able to use as a way in. So she might um, need to be dreaming a certain way or uh, her brain waves need to be in a certain pattern. And here I'm speculating, but uh, the thing is that I have seen cases like this. So, uh, you know, I have to surmise that there's something going on in the alteration of, of consciousness that these entities like or prefer or need. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, shadow people are seen during the day. Uh, ah. They're seen in haunted locations. Uh, and people who are frequent experiencers will see, sometimes see them, like, flitting about the house. But the dominant experience is a nighttime visit where you wake up from sleep. Mm-hmm. So that means... So do they come because we're asleep and they can stand there and, and do their thing uh, without us noticing them? Or is there something about our dreaming consciousness that enables them to pull them themselves in? Right. It be a bit of both. I think that's People want to know, well, what are they doing? They're just standing there staring. Right. And I think that they're collecting information. Uh, they may be probing us in certain ways. Some people feel that they're being like mind scanned or my, even mind programmed. Um, but it, it, you know, it's, it's peculiar too because it's like the abducting ETs. It's like, okay, how many of us human beings do you ETs have to take away and examine before you finally get it? <laughs> right. What's going on with us? Right. And it's the same with shadow people. It's like, you know, well, I could see maybe you come coming and standing there once or twice, but repeatedly over the years, what gives? Mm-hmm. Well, you you made a good point before in the possibility that if we, our energy, our emotions are considered sustenance to these individuals, just like we need food, we don't just eat once or twice and then stop, the same goes for them. There would have to be a constant supply of this energy, hence the, the multiple visits and, you know, so, so maybe it's not necessarily curiosity as much as it is a food source. We are a food source. Right? It's quite likely that we are. And uh, they could also hmm. be entertaining themselves and our thoughts and memories and, you know, things like that. There are all kinds of possibilities. So many, yes. That we have to consider. Right. What's the most bizarre shadow person story you've ever heard, Rosemary? Oh, gosh. Um... I'm sure they're all... I pull one out of the hopper. Um, they're just also strange. and They are. Uh, you know, they, some of them have different appearances. Um, some of them communicate after a time. The ones who seem mm. to be attached to people as, as what I would call the lifelong companion, um, they will communicate telepathically. I see. But most of these visitors do not communicate at all. Uh, and some of my more bizarre cases are actually haunting cases where uh, the, the entity that's creating a great deal of disturbance is a djinn and takes multiple forms, even a dozen or more different forms, including shadow people. Mm-hmm. Fascinating. Wow. You know, Kelly has been having these experiences again for, well, she, she seems to think that they started as a child, although she can't recall specifics. She's really kind of documenting the last, or, you know, mentally documenting the last, I don't know, close to 20 years. But I guess my question for her is, would be, how would one deal, how would you deal with this? Should something be done about this? or? Or do we just let these experiences continue? I mean, it's not like you can go to your doctor and say, give me a pill for shadow people. <laughs> but and not to make light of it, but these are experiences that seem to be clearly plaguing for whatever the reason is, whether it's malevolent or benevolent, these people are freaked out. What can they do, if anything? Is there anything they can do to, to help it cease? There's no universal one-size-fits-all Band-Aid I know. to address any and every situation. Uh, there are things that work. They work for some people, or they work sometimes and not all of the time. So I tell people that they just have to experiment until they find something. Mm-hmm. And, um, and people also have different tolerances. Um, I have 
some lifelong serial experiencers who develop a tolerance, and as long as things stay within a certain kind of range, you know, then it's like, oh, yeah, you again. Right, um, right. Well, that's what Kelly actually admitted. She said to, to me that, um, I, I don't know if I'd call it a tolerance, because she says every time it happens, it's the same. It's almost like a feedback loop. She'll wake up with a start. She'll make a <gasps> kind of a startled sound as if, you know, just seeing it for the first time. Um, so certainly she's never, oh, it's you again. But she says that when the experience is over, she goes through the routine of getting up, looking down the hall to see if anyone's there, turning on the light, of course. During the day, she doesn't think about it. It's just, you know, she's obviously hoping it doesn't happen again. Invariably, it does. But I do believe that she has developed a bit of a tolerance for this experience. And uh, um, so, again, p part of the reason why I really wanted to bring this to the forefront and, and get your way in is to to help people, at least e even if it's just by virtue of um, uh, knowing they have company. <laughs> They're not the only ones having these experiences. Um, so, but quite the, the thing that uh, probably is the most effective for the most people, but again, I stress, none of these remedies are 100%, is electromagnetic disturbance. Uh, keeping lights and TV on uh, seems to disrupt the ability of these entities to either come in or, or to stay. Um, that is not 100%. Um, I have people who are terrorized by these beings who have everything on blazing away in the right. house. Right. Mm. Um, uh, for other people, prayer is effective. Um, no particular prayer, just whatever rings your chimes. Right. You have to have a connection to the prayer. Uh, if you just recite a prayer because somebody told you it was a good idea, it's probably not going to work because you won't have any connection to it. That's right. There's got to be um, feeling. Some mm. people have used magical amulets. Um, Crystals. People use anger. Um, and uh, I, I list a lot of those in my guide to the dark side. Uh, and I, what I tell people is, well, here are the things that have worked for other people. And you're just going to have to experiment with these to find something that works for you. Mm -hmm. Long-term experiencers usually find out that something will work for a while and then it won't. And they have to switch to something else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like these beings develop a tolerance uh, to it, you know, like um, bacteria is not affected by That's right. you know, drugs after a while, mm -hmm. uh, or they figure out a way to nullify it. Mm -hmm. What about time of year? You know, we, we, talk, uh, we, we talk a lot about, I don't know, astrological alignment, certain times of year, things, things that, or... or um, times that may be more uh, akin or um, the propensity for things like this happening at certain times of year. Have you noticed a, a, a trend in when these things are happening, the reports that you're getting, you know, the winter solstice, the summer solstice, winter or summer, anything like that? There are some vague patterns, uh, nothing that's that's very strong. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of paranormal phenomena in general, um, there's a pattern for um, greater intensity the day or two before and after the full moon and the day or two before and after the new moon. Interesting. Not, not on the day of. Right, uh, before or after. People have shadow people experiences all the time. And I've not been able to pinpoint any particular day of the week or season of the year or time time of the day to to make a good generalization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Most, uh, most of our bedroom uh, visitation experiences, including shadow people as well as ghosts and ET abductions and you know, hosts of other things that we can't explain, uh, they do occur typically middle of the night, like between 2 and 5 in the morning. Right. And three to four is the most active hour. I suspect that there's something about the state of our consciousness in the deepest part of the night. You know, because most people, by the time you hit the middle of the night, your dreaming is, uh, your brain waves are in a certain state. You are likely to be in a very, you know, deep state of sleep or, you know, rising up you know, going through a dreaming stage where your consciousness is, is uh, ascending a bit. 
So these could be all uh, brainwave patterns that these entities know how to, to work, more or less. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Do you think we will ever have an explanation for this, and for that matter, even other paranormal phenomena, a definitive explanation? The paranormal is fraught with trickster all the time. And uh, every time you think you're close to the truth or a revelation or an explanation, um, it just side slips and shifts away from you. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we are right that these visitations are purposeful from uh, beings who have agendas with human beings, until we discover more about those agendas or we have a more marked contact with these beings, a lot of it's going to remain a mystery. Mm -hmm. We can continue. I think it's, it's purposeful to document as much as we can. And uh, we can glean quite a bit from patterns. This is why I think it's so important to pay more attention to the how and why of people's experiences rather than trying to debate whether or not they had it. That's right. Clearly that something happened. Right, yeah. Uh, and... Uh, by looking at the patterns, uh, we might get some ideas about what's going on or um, be able to counteract things more or experiment on our own to get additional information. Okay, fascinating. Rosemary, I want to thank you so much for shedding light on the shadow, pun intended, this has been an extraordinary discussion, and, and again, I just want to thank you for all of your diligent work in such a complex uh, field of study. You have been at this for quite a long time, and I know that there are thousands and, and thousands of people that are so grateful, as am I, for your work, so thank you so much. One other thing I just want to mention, I'm so excited that Rosemary, um, as a thank you uh, to Kelly, will be giving her an autographed copy of your... Now, Rosemary has quite a few books out there. Which, which book do you think she's going to get? And I'm sure she would love to read more about shadow people. I think my guide to the dark side of the paranormal would be very illuminating for her. It's a, a collection of um, chapters and articles on about 20 topics that I get asked about a lot, where people have concerns and issues about troubling things. Wow. And the well, purpose in doing this book was to give people objective information for what's going on and what are some of the things they can do to regain control. Fantastic. And, uh, that, that's a lot of it right there, that sometimes we can't make it all go away to see right. ourselves, but we can at least feel like um, you know, we're in the driver's seat. Wonderful. Well, I know this will be helpful to Kelly and to everybody else out there. Um, you know, go get this book. Go peruse um, Rosemary's website. Why don't you give us our web, your website, Rosemary? My main site is visionaryliving.com. Uh, lots of articles on the website, my blog and calendar as well. And then I have another website called ginuniverse.com, D-J-I-N-N -N Universe. And that is an educational site about the gym. Fantastic. Well, we will have both of those links connected to uh, the interview. Again, thank you so much, Rosemary. And I can't wait for us to catch up again soon. Thank you. Alexis. All right. Amid the range of experiences that one might call paranormal in nature, the shadow person phenomenon ranks as one of the most mysterious yet ubiquitous anomalies known to man. To learn more about shadow people and other such phenomena, pick up a copy of Rosemary's book, Guide to the Dark Side of the Paranormal. You can also visit her website at visionaryliving.com. Thank you for listening to Higher Journeys. Until next time, I'm Alexis Brooks.